What's up, everybody? Celtics podcast here. Want to talk about Kemba Walker being traded to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Obviously, this is big news coming out of Celtics Nation. And a lot of people are really, really excited about it. And I want to tell you why I'm not excited about it. <laughs> so great. That's me. I'm, I'm the killjoy again. I'm here to take away all your joy and happiness. So I don't have anything scripted for this video. If I'm rambling a bit, I apologize. But I just want to share my, my reaction, my feelings. I've slept on it for a day so that I didn't just come out too hot with the reaction. But uh, I think at this point, after about 24 hours, I'm, my feelings are solidified. So yeah, I don't like it. I don't hate it, but I don't like it. And I think the main reason I don't hate it is because I'm just, I'm tired, man. As a Celtics fan, I'm just, I'm browbeaten. Like just from the Kyrie experience, doing Isaiah Thomas dirty, and then signing Gordon and his foot falling off and just his injury plagued years here. And then signing Kemba and his knee falling off and his injury plagued years here. The, the Memphis and the Sacramento picks, which were both supposed to be top five picks, turning into pick 14 and Romeo Langford and Aaron Neesmith. It's just been, I know it's weird for Boston to complain about bad luck because we've won like the most championships, but God, man, it's been just been a dreadful run and I'm just tired. And that was my general reaction to this trade was just more tiredness. Now, the trade, I'm sure everybody is aware of it. We basically swapped Kemba Walker for Al Horford and traded a first round pick, 16 in this year's draft, for Moses Brown, a seven foot two center from Oklahoma City. And then we swapped future second round picks, which doesn't really matter, to be honest. Now, a lot of people are really really excited about this trade and honestly i i don't i don't understand why and and let me explain let me explain why you shouldn't be excited so obviously the kemba experiment has has gone horribly wrong you know we can't depend on him he's been an absolute no show in the playoffs um his knee is you know i mean i called this when his knee issues first started cropping up I said, this is the beginning of the end. Like these things just don't go away for, for players at that age, at that size. And I, and I hate to be right, but I, I was right. The knee thing has just gotten worse and worse and worse. I mean, last year he was playing every other game, sometimes not even that. And it's, and that a whole reason we did that was so that he would be healthy for the playoffs. Obviously he was not healthy for the playoffs. So who knows what Kemba can even produce going forward, but looking backwards, even last year where Kemba, I mean, I rode Kemba as hard as, as anybody. He was a real disappointment, but he still averaged nearly 20 points a game. So like, let's not get it twisted. Like trading Kemba Walker for Al Horford is a downgrade. It is a downgrade in talent. Now you might say, oh, well, Al Horford can play every day. Well, we'll see. I mean, last year he was chilling at home watching Sports Center, you know, and he's 35 years old now. So that's, you know, the first, just looking at this trade and measuring the value, you have to basically say, okay, we've, we've swapped Kemba Walker for Al Horford, and we've swapped the 16th pick in the draft for, for Moses Brown. So when you're looking at value, those are the two places that you really want to start. And I'm going to kind of break down why neither one of those is, is a good return of value. But before I even do that, let's, let's go through the brain of, of Adam, the, the armchair GM. Because I, I don't like what Brad Stevens is doing. I'm not surprised at all. I don't think Brad Stevens is going to do a good job as the GM of, of the Celtics. Um, I'm really worried. I'm quite worried. And like, so Kemba Walker is not happy. There was a report out recently from Jared Weiss in The Atlantic talking about how Kemba Walker was upset when Danny started shopping him, uh, which is ridiculous because, you know, when you're making $35 million a year and your knee falls off, like, you know, that's the business. But the other thing apparently that came out was that he, his relationship with Brad Stevens was soured as well because Brad, uh, apparently Gordon Hayward told Brad that he needed to be harder on his players or he was going to lose the locker room or something like something along those lines. And so he basically was like harping on Kemba Walker to play defense harder. And then that really bothered Kemba. 
because he felt like he was get, getting singled out. And to be honest with you, if I was Kemba Walker, that would bother me too, man. Because like, why are you harping on Kemba Walker for his defense? Like Kemba Walker tries on defense. He is just unable. Like everybody knows that he, he hustles, he plays hard. He just can't play defense because he's tiny. Like if you want to harp on somebody for defense, try harping on Jalen Brown who just loafed through last season on the defensive end and actually has the capability of playing defense. So like, I don't understand that at all, but in some respects I do because it was clear that Brad Stevens had lost the locker room, which is another reason why I think promoting him to GM is a terrible move because these players, they already don't have a great relationship with Brad Stevens. And now he's the big boss. Like it makes anyway, that's an argument for another day, but my whole dream scenario was next year you put Kemba on the bench and you make him into Lou Williams. I've been calling him Lou Williams for two years. Nobody, nobody friggin' listens to me. You put Kemba Walker, you put his ass on the bench. You play him 18 to 22 minutes per game when he's healthy. And, and when he plays off the bench, he can be his real self. He can, he can take the ball and do his little jitterbug thing and not ever pass it and look for shots and score. He can be a microwave scorer off the bench when he's available. Now, is Kemba Walker going to be happy in that role? No, almost definitely not. Is that a bad thing? No, it's a great thing because Kemba Walker's contract is massive next year and the year after it's even more massive. But in that second year, it's a player option. Now, Kemba Walker has said this repeatedly where he just wants to play somewhere where he is wanted. So what do you do? GM Adam says you make him stay here next year and you make him feel unwanted. That way, when his player option comes up, he declines it. I mean, I, this doesn't seem like rocket science to me. So you, you basically, you know, you make him feel like he's not wanted here. And that way he opts out. That means we only have one more year of Kemba Walker. And then we get his contract off the books. And guess what we don't have to do? We don't have to trade away a first round draft pick to get rid of him. He walks of his own volition. And that frees up like $37 million, something crazy like that on the salary cap. Boom, open. Like That was my plan. That was my plan all along. You put him on the bench. You don't depend on him. You keep him on the team and you just, you alienate him so that he walks and you, and you free up that money naturally. Now, of course, Brad Stevens is unable to do this because this guy wants to win now. It's the same problem I have with Danny Ainge. They have to win now and they have no, no vision of the future. So in his mind, he's like, I can't have an unhappy uh, Kemba Walker on the bench. That's not going to be great for next season. I need to win now. So what am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to pay to get rid of Kemba Walker. Now, this is exactly what I didn't want to do. I was all for trading Kemba Walker. If, if the opportunity presented itself where we actually got value back and we weren't actually just paying to get rid of him. So that's why I thought we're never going to trade Kemba Walker. I, I was shocked that this trade happened because I didn't see the opportunity for us to get equal value back. I, I only saw the opportunity that basically happened, that we would have to include draft picks to get rid of Kemba Walker, which is what we did. Now, some people might say, that's crazy. We did get value back. We got Al Horford back. Everybody loves Al Horford. I love Al Horford. We got Moses Brown back. Um, and that's true. But let me just break down why why this isn't equal value so first of all let's start with let's start with al horford i love al horford but i think that celtics fans are like a bit twisted where they've got this like vision of 2018 al horford coming back to the celtics and that's that's not who we're getting back okay al horford is 35 years old and he's not the same player he used to be now that doesn't mean that he can't be productive you know, last year on a really bad team in Oklahoma City, when he was playing, he was putting up, I think, like 14 points per game. He was also averaging like six rebounds. So like we always had issues with Al rebounding the basketball when, when he was here in Boston. And it's only gotten worse and it's only going to continue to get worse. He is not going to rebound the ball anymore. 
He's going to be able to space the floor. He's going to be able to actually move the ball, which I know is like something the Celtics desperately need. I mean, this is how depressing the Celtics situation is right now. Like Al Horford coming to this team, he automatically becomes the second best passer on this roster, which is disgusting, but it's true. So, I mean, these things are great. But I think people who are like, oh, Al Horford's back. We're going to have a good defensive team because he's back. Um, I don't, I think you're overrating what what Al Horford is capable of at this point in his career. You know, he's got old legs. Do people not remember like the last year he was here, like him laying on the sidelines, getting his hamstrings stretched out, like during timeouts, like that was two years ago. He's two years older and people think he's just going to jump in and be this great player. I, look, I love Al Horford's personality, his leadership. I love his intangibles. I love, like I said, I love the fact that he can hang out on the perimeter, open up the court, uh, pass the ball around, move the ball. We desperately need more players like that, but I, I'm just not, I'm not overrating what he's capable of. He's not going to be putting up 20 points a game like Kemba was when he was playing. That's not happening. So there's definitely a downgrade in talent in, the, in there. And also contractually, everyone's like, oh, but, but Al's contract is so much better. You know, that's why we made this deal to get off of Kemba's s- salary. But again, I don't agree with this because in my, in my dream, Kemba Walker opts out after next season, which means that we just have one more year to eat this horrible salary and then he's gone. Whereas with Al Horford, he has two years guaranteed left. And yes, both years are less money, guaranteed, but they're guaranteed. So next year, first of all, we saved like $9 million this year, which who cares? Why would fans care if ownership saves money this year? Next year, we save about $11 million, which is nice. But like, what are we doing next year? Are we winning a championship next year? Do we need that $11 million to to make a huge move, or are we just going to dump it on a long-term salary for Evan Fournier and screw up our roster for the next three years? So, okay, so $11 million free next year, good, fine, whatever. And then the year after that, I think it's like $13 million because Al Horford's contract goes down to $14.5 million guaranteed. But again, we're looking at $14.5 million guaranteed versus like Kemba's $37 million player option, which, of course, if he opted in, would be brutal for this team, but I just like, he's not happy here and we can make him even more unhappy. If we kept him, I can't envision a scenario where Kemba Walker opts in and says, yeah, I love this. I love Danny Ainge trying to trade me and Brad Stevens yelling at me for not playing defense. I'm going to opt in. I'm going to stay one more year. I just, I just can't envision that happening. So in my mind, and why I don't, other people don't see this, I don't understand, is I'm comparing Al Horford's $14.5 million to Kemba Walker's zero in year two. And that's, again, where it doesn't make sense to me. So I already don't love the swap there. You know, everyone's saying, oh, it's such a great move, salary for salary. I, I, I don't know that I agree. Secondly, let's take a look at uh, Moses Brown. Now, Moses Brown is, in a lot of ways, the key to how this deal is going to be viewed down the road because Moses Brown is a nice young player. But again, I think people don't have a good idea of how good of a player he is or could be. So first of all, if you look at Moses Brown as a swap for the 16th pick in this draft, that is not good value. It's not. Now, could it be down the road if he, keeps getting better and turns into a great player? Sure. But on its face right now, it is not good value. And here's how I know. Here's how I know it's not good value. First of all, who do you trust more as a GM and an evaluator of talent? Brad Stevens, who loves Semi Ojale, or Sam Presti? Sam Presti knows Moses Brown better than anybody. And he thought that Trading Moses Brown for the 16th pick in this year's draft was a smart move. So who do you think, who do you think knows where the value is? I'm just saying, like, it doesn't mean that Sam Presley can't be wrong. Of course he could be wrong. But I'm just saying, like, I trust his opinion a lot more than I trust Brad Stevens. And he thinks that trade swapping 
because he has no intentions of playing Kemba Walker. Like that was not what this deal was about for Presti. This deal was about getting another first round pick. He literally took an undrafted player in Moses Brown and turned him into a 16th pick in the draft. This is why Sam Presti is amazing. This is why Sam Presti should be the GM of the Celtics right now. They should have made a move for him if, if he would even be interested and not Brad Stevens who thinks great. What I really want to do is my first move as the leader of the Boston Celtics is trade a first round pick for a player that we could have just re-signed two years ago, but we didn't. We let them walk so that now we could bring them back when they're two years older by paying a first round pick for them. Does that make sense to you? Why? Why does that make sense to people? Because that's, that's what happened here. We literally just gave up a first round pick so we could bring Al Horford back who we could have, we could have already had him. So let's also not get twisted on, on the fact that many people are saying that this year's draft is going to be the best draft since 2003. Okay. This year's draft is loaded. Now they do say it's mostly loaded with high end talent, but again, this is a good draft. This is not the kind of draft that you want to trade out of. And I know people are going to say, oh man, we keep having these 14, 15, 16 pick and we're doing nothing with them. And while I agree, I agree with that. Yes, there are the Romeo Langfords and the James Youngs and, you know, maybe even the Aaron Neesmiths. There's also the Terry Rogiers and the Rajon Rondos and players that you can get in that range that really make a difference. And, you know, you just... With the draft, the way it works is you just have to take a lot of swings, man. You just have to keep swinging and, and hope you get a hit. And guess what you can't do? You can't take a swing if you don't have a pick. And so now we're looking at basically people talking themselves into Moses Brown, who was an undrafted rookie, being of equivalent value to the 16th pick in this year's draft, which, again, is it possible that somebody that OKC drafts a player at 16 and Moses Brown ends up being a better player? Of course it's possible, but that's not the most likely option. If it was, Sam Presti would not have made this trade. And you watch Sam Presti end up flipping Kemba Walker to like the Knicks or something for more draft capital. You just watch and people in Celtics Nation are going to be scratching their head like, why didn't we do that trade? If there's somebody out there that actually wants Kemba, why didn't we do that trade? And the answer is because Brad Stevens is not the guy. So Moses Brown is 21 years old. He's seven foot two. And last year at, in Oklahoma City, at about 22 minutes per game, he averaged nine points and nine rebounds a game and a block. Um, good numbers, good numbers for a young center. I, I like, first of all, let me just say for the record, I like Moses Brown. He's got an amazing contract. He's been a productive big. Um, at a young age, which you don't often see. So he, he, I think he does have the potential to be a really nice piece. But again, people need to hit the brakes here. Because first of all, I hear people saying like, oh, he's basically Robert Williams. Stop. Stop. Blasphemous. He is not Robert Williams. He is not Robert Williams. Okay, now look, Robert Williams is not perfect. He has a really hard time staying on the floor. He has some serious, serious health concerns that, that may prevent him from ever being a great player. But if he can get over those health concerns, he's a million times the player that Moses Brown is. And here's why. If you look at the numbers and you're dumb, you might say, oh, they're the same player. Like Rob averaged like nine point eight points and seven boards last year and and Moses averaged nine and nine. They're the, they're the same guy. They're not. First of all, Rob averaged nearly two blocks per game in less minutes than Moses Brown, who averaged one block per game in more minutes. So Rob is a, is a difference maker around the rim. He is an incredible shot blocker and leaper and a difference maker. And Moses Brown is not. He's a pretty good defender. He's seven foot two. He blocks some shots. Um, he also shot 55%, I think, field goal percentage, Moses Brown, and Rob shot like 75%. So like, yeah, the points are kind of equal, but Moses was playing on a bad team, taking a lot of shots. Rob was playing on a 
bad team and not taking a lot of shots and making almost all of them. So, you know, I think Rob is a better scorer. I think he's a better rebounder. He's, he's a million times better passer. And yeah, he's got the health issues. Now, Moses Brown doesn't have the health issues. He's a really good rebounder. He can score and he's a decent defender. They are not the same player. If you want to, if you want a player comp, think of Moses Brown more like Tristan Thompson, <laughs> more like a seven foot two Tristan Thompson, more like a seven foot two Taco Fall that's not so slow. Those are honestly better player comps than than Rob. He's not Rob. He doesn't have that athleticism. He doesn't have that ability to move the ball. Moses Brown averaged 0.2 assists per game last year, 0.2. Rob averaged nearly two assists per game, I think. He's a fantastic passer. So they're, so just get that out of your head that these are like, that they're the same guy. They're not. They're not. Now, another issue is like just roster makeup. So the Celtics have like six centers on their roster now. And I know that a lot of them are probably and hopefully not coming back. But as of the moment, we have like Taco Fall, Luke Cornett, Rob Williams, Tristan Thompson, Al Horford, and Moses Brown, which is insane. Like if you can remember last year, we had three centers and that was too many. So obviously there's still some moves that need to be made. I, I, I would say that Luke Cornett and Taco Fall are done. They're not coming back. So there's now we're down to four. and. Obviously, everybody wants to deal Tristan Thompson. But, like, again, who wants to take Tristan Thompson? Who wants to pay $10 million for that player? So what, what likely might end up happening, there's two likely scenarios. Brad might end up trading Tristan Thompson and package another first-round pick or something to get rid of him because Brad apparently just hates rookies and thinks we need to win now. Don't forget that Brad Stevens is the same guy who pressured Danny Ainge last year and said, I can't handle any more rookies. Don't give me more rookies. So Danny Ainge ended up giving away Desmond Bain for nothing so that Brad Stevens could keep semi friggin' Ojale. And Desmond Bain went on to make second team all rookie and play meaningful minutes in the playoffs. And what's semi Ojale doing? Well, he's going to be a personal trainer next year. That's what semi Ojale is doing. So that's who's running the Celtics right now, that Brad Stevens. But my, my hope is that they find somebody who actually wants Tristan, maybe like one of the L.A. teams, think they could actually use him. And, and if we can just give Tristan away for nothing, that's a win. Just get him off the team for nothing, that, that's a win. So then we're down to Horford, Rob Williams, and Moses Brown. I think that's – if we can have that be our big man rotation, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, what else did I want to say? Oh, God. What I'm really worried about is that, is that Brad Stevens is going to trade Rob Williams. Because, I, again, I, I just – Brad has this weird thing. I don't trust Brad about what players he likes. And he doesn't seem to like Rob Williams very much. Like – Rob Williams averaged 18 minutes per game last year, and I know his health was always a concern, but Rob Williams was one of our absolute best players when he was on the court last year. And yet R Brad was consistently giving Tristan Thompson minutes over him early in the season, and nobody understood why. And so I am a little bit worried that Brad is going to trade Rob Williams and keep Tristan Thompson and Al Horford and Moses Malone. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Moses Brown. God, it would be great if we had Moses Malone. <sighs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that because I just don't think Rob is just like a huge gamble. I get it. Because of his health, he's a huge gamble. But, but I also think because of his health that you're, you're never going to get equivalent value for a guy like that because, because if he reaches his, his true potential, he is a real difference maker. He is a star. And – I don't think you're going to get that kind of value back for him because of his health concerns. So you're almost, you're almost just stuck gambling, rolling the dice with Rob Williams and just hoping, hoping that he can stay on the floor. 
So that's, yeah, that is my, my gut reaction. And the reaction I have after sleeping on it for 24 hours to this trade, I, I don't love it. I think we, I think we paid to get rid of Kemba Walker, which is just, we could have just let him ride off into the sunset after this next season. We could have used him off the bench in his, what should be his natural role from this point forward in his career. And we could have freed up, you know, 30 plus million dollars in that second year. And then, and then actually looked at the possibility of adding another star to this team, which obviously hasn't gone well for us lately, but we could have actually entertained that possibility. The way the roster is constructed right now, there's no, there's no third star coming. It's not happening at least for another two years. And most likely beyond that, because then, you know, if you want to free up money two years down the road, Horford's going to have to be gone. Smart's going to have to be gone. Rob Williams is probably going to have to be gone. You can't bring back Evan Fournier. I mean, I just don't see the the path. So, yeah, I don't hate the trade. I think I saw somebody uh, on Celtics blog or one of those media outlets give the trade a C plus. That feels about right to me. I think I, I would maybe even go a little bit lower and say C minus or, or D plus. But again, a lot of this, a lot of this hinges on, on what happens with, with Moses Brown. If Moses Brown can actually develop into a, into a really solid piece, then you know three or four years down the road, people are, are going to look back fondly on this trade. But you just don't know. You, you don't know what to do with Moses Brown's numbers because he was playing on such a crap team, you know? And, and to be honest with you, when, when centers shoot 50% field goal, I, um, that's, I don't think that's a great sign, but we'll see. I, I, I do like Moses Brown as a player and I hope it works out, but yeah. Um, if you're still here, hit the comments and let me know what you think. I imagine that most people probably disagree with me. There seems to be a lot of optimism about this trade. So if you are optimistic, I, I'd love to hear why. I would love to try to sponge off some of your optimism because I'm, I'm certainly not feeling it. And uh, yeah, I'll probably have a few more of these in the offseason because I think there's a lot more moves to come. And I'll see you next time on Ransom Reviews.